Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited. We have James Chartrand, who's one of the top copywriters. She is the founder and creator of Damn Fine Words, one of the best online writing courses you'll ever see. Uh, I read that online, so it is true. She's also the founder of Men With Pens, a world-class website design and copywriting company. She's built two world-recognized businesses from scratch and has a blog with over 41,000 readers. She's been featured in Forbes, Newsweek, The New York Times, and Huffington Post. She writes regularly for well-known sites like Copyblogger, and uh, James, so I looked up your name on Copyblogger to see, read some of your posts, and you have 10 pages of results from yeah, all the posts that? you've written for them. <laughs> it's awesome. I loved writing for them. I've, I haven't been writing for them recently because I'm off doing my own little projects sure. these days, but it was a great time mm. writing for yeah. them. Sure. Thank you for pages. joining me, by the way. <laughs> You're welcome. It's great to be here with you. Yeah. And so I always like to include a fun fact. And... A fun fact about you is you have 15 minute stress out sessions. Tell me about that. So I do really good phone. Um, I typically, you know, have client calls. I have interviews all the time and I'm great on them. I used to stress out so badly mm -hmm. because I'd wonder, is today going to be the day? That Since we're in the wilderness and we got cut off um, and there's two feet of snow there. Uh, so you were saying about your stress out sessions. Yeah, so I'd have these stress out sessions that lasted, you know, the whole day before and the whole moment walking up to this call. Um, I got some really great advice from someone who said, you know what, if you're going to stress out, that's great. Do it profoundly. Do it with your full attention. Mm -hmm. Give yourself 15 minutes before the call. Stress out all you want. Pull out your hair, smoke cigarettes, pace around the room, then it's done. And I've started implementing that, oh, I guess two years ago. And it's really worked out great because if I start to stress out uh, several hours earlier, I'm like, no, no, we'll save this for the stress out session, make a really good one. So, yeah. <laughs> so what's your routine for the stress out session? What do you do? Um, you you know? like yell at the top of your lungs outside. You <laughs> yeah. go shooting wild I, game in the wilderness. I walk an awful lot. I must have, you know, marks around my floor in my house. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, you know, James... One thing, and I want to talk about your story and kind of where you started, sure. but I want to talk about first one thing the audience can do to get a quick win, to get results, to improve their copy. What, what do you recommend people do? You know, the biggest offender I'm seeing these days, and it's been going on for a long time, but I guess people still don't get it. Um, there's a lot of egotistical copy. It's unintentional. People don't mean to be egotistical, hmm. but they use a lot of I. They use a lot of we. We are the best. We can help you. I do this. I do that. If you just make a simple change, count all the times you say I or we in your copy and rework the sentence so that it says you, you dear reader are going to really enjoy this, you dear client are going to experience you know beautiful things. That simple switch of making it from I to you makes yeah. it very customer focused and it really pays off the whole tone changes like that instantly. Yeah, yeah that's a great tip and you know it's interesting because we as people think about ourselves from our own view. We are egotistical. How did you first discover that to even do that? Couldn't tell you. I've been doing it for years, so the first time I hit upon that, it's You're just not it's egotistical. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm as egotistical as the next person, you know? <laughs> I want to find out, you know, what was it like growing up? What were some of the big influences for you? What was it like growing up? Well, yeah. I'm from a very small village. Uh, we were 30 people in the village. Really? Was, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, in the great Canadian wilderness. Uh, I live in a predominantly French province, which is like a state for anyone who's American. Yeah. Um, I guess, uh, you know, 90% of the population is probably French. And I was the little English girl in this little village. So I grew up always kind of being on the outside, always being the minority. But that's the way things work were. Uh, we experienced a lot of things like languageism. When you come to a store and you speak in English, well, you don't get served the same way as mm. if you speak in French. Interesting. So 
I kind of grew up with biases and stereotypes and, and these sort of things helped me later on, um, especially when I developed my male persona, because for me it was no big deal. It's just a label. I'm English, big deal. I'm use a pen name, big deal. You know, mm -hmm. um, I don't really say that I have any influences that led me to where I am today. Mm. Uh, I didn't get started in copywriting until I had two kids under my belt, you know, mm. so there you go. <laughs> did you have a propensity for writing? What did your parents do? Yeah, I have the typical, you know, I've been writing since I'm a, a small child story behind me and I loved it in high school and mm. I, people always love my stories and I took some writing courses in CJEP. Uh, so I've always been writing. Um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. She was 100% French. Uh, my dad was a consultant in the food industry, feeding large groups of people. So he was a businessman, hmm. purely English. So, yeah. So what was it like growing up in a 30-person town? What do you even do for fun? We rode our bicycles an awful lot. We'd get into trouble in the woods an awful lot. <laughs> you know, you make campfires and hang out. And uh, everyone's mom knew everyone's mom. All the kids knew each other. Mm -hmm. They all knew where we were at any given time. So mm -hmm. it, it's both very freeing mm -hmm. and very limiting at yeah. the same time. Time, yeah. I mean, you obviously liked it because you stayed. I love it. You stayed, yeah. I love it, yeah. It's interesting because a lot of people say, you know, there's so many places to see in the world. Where would you love to live? Right here, right here. <laughs> so when you ventured out of that 30 person town, where was the first place that you went? That was there any uh, culture shock when you went to a big city I've, or? Yeah, I've had two culture shocks. When I was 14, I got the chance to go to Florida and that was a big deal. That's like the Canadian dream to go to Florida. <laughs> um, and it was just wild. I remember palm trees. I'd never seen that. It's like seeing something out of a movie. And one thing that struck me was everyone down there would say, hi, how are you? Uh, we don't do that up here. Nobody speaks to each other up here. So it's like, why is really? this stranger talking to me? Yeah, yeah. See, when I think of Canadians, I think of the most friendly people on earth. Generally speaking, yes. Yeah. In Quebec, it's a much more independent subset of Canadians. Yeah. And we just don't get into each other's way. But we are all friendly, yeah, for yeah. sure. The second time I had culture shock uh, was when I went to Toronto, actually. It's a huge city, huge, and full of racial mixes and all different kinds of people. And I just couldn't get over how big a world it was. Yeah. And for the first three days of my vacation, I spent a lot of time, you know, kind of trying to protect myself from all these people. I just wasn't used to it. It's a huge difference. I mean, you yeah, yeah. come from a 30-person town. You go to a huge city. I can yeah. imagine. And it's like only six hours away from me. So you'd think I'd had experience with that. But no, no way. Interesting. Yeah. So I want to find out the, the early days of your career. Because you didn't start off a writer. What did. did you start off doing? Oh, my gosh. I've done everything. I used to, uh, I used to pump gas. I used to be a small motors mechanic. Uh, really? I worked in, yeah, for sure. I worked in a corporate environment for about uh, 10 years and I did uh, purchasing, administration, shipping and transport, all kinds of office job things. Um, I got reorganized out of that and took a leaving package to go home uh, and I saw an ad in the paper to work at a stables and I thought that was great. I'd, I've been riding since I was a little kid so I worked at a stables for several years. Um, but we live in a very touristy area. We depend on tourists to survive. And in the wintertime, I had recently separated. I had two kids. Mm. Tourism industry fell down, and there wasn't any money coming in. Mm. And I didn't have a job. The perfect had, worst storm. Yeah, yeah. It was terrible. Um, and I remember the lowest moment at that point was here I am on my own with two kids to support. And I had the papers to apply for welfare yeah. wow. um, on my kitchen table. And I just felt terrible that I couldn't take care of myself. And someone said, well, why don't you go look on the internet? I hear there's some writing jobs there. You're a good writer. You could do that. And lo and behold, there was writing jobs. They paid a buck for 500 words. Really? I thought it was money from heaven. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first week of my, my work, I had $8 and I could buy bread and milk. And I thought that was stupendous. So that's really how I got my uh, start in writing. It was 
you know, necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. Yeah. So, James, what was one of the first jobs that was memorable to you when you look back on your early early days of the writing career? Mm. Early days of the writing career, uh, what was spectacular to me, I landed a large contract uh, writing what they call spin articles. You say the same thing 10 different ways and the client mm. gets 10 different mm -hmm. articles. Uh, and it was a gig for $60,000 over a one month period. That's amazing. Yeah, it, for me that was huge. So I had to hustle, I had to hire some writers, I had to get a little stable going and I started managing and overseeing the projects and I realized I really liked that. Number one, I really liked the money and I really liked being able to have my own business. And I think that's when I realized the potential that I had in my hands that I could take this much further than just writing myself my own. Yeah. I mean, once you get that kind of job and have to hire other people, it takes a certain skill set. What did you learn from the corporate job or is there anything you took from previous that allowed you to, to, it was, to do that? It was crazy. You know, I, I tend to believe that you can always take uh, certain skills that you've learned from previous experience and transfer them to new skills that you're trying to learn. So, you know, uh, I took my typing skills. I learned typing in school. I brought that over. I took my purchasing skills to hire people. Uh, shipping and transportation taught me, you know, how to deliver to clients and how to manage a schedule. So I transferred a lot of everything I'd learned to this new career. And I'm still doing that today. Every time I learn something new, I bring it into my career. How can this work for me? Where can I use this? Yeah. So when you first started, what was the first, after that big project, what was the next big milestone? Big milestone for me, uh, back then when blogging was new, it was a very small culture. There were only a few great leaders. Brian Clark of Copyblogger is one of them. I like to call him the first wave people. Um, and then there was people like us, the B wave, the second group who came in. Um, yeah, who else was in that top? Who else did you consider who, like leading the industry at that time besides uh, Brian? Who else um, was around there? Michel Fortin was around there. I've known him for a mm -hmm. long time. Uh, copy blogger, freelance folder. Uh, I, you know, it's been so long I forget some of the yeah. names. I still see some faces now, but a lot of things have changed. So people have gone out of business, unfortunately. Yeah. Anyways, we had a, a little thing going where Michael Stelzer had a top 10 blogs of the year. Um, and he'd run this every year and it was a rather big deal. And I happened to have my blog at the time get picked up in that and things just exploded. It was like I'd been discovered. If yeah, you that's amazing. Yeah. It was great. It was a great feeling. So when did you first launch Men With Pens? Men With Pens came about, uh, I think it was 2007. Yeah. And I started in 2006 under a different company name, a uh, different personal name. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I had switched to Men With Pens. I think it was around 2007, 2008 maybe. Yeah. 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 So tell me about that personal name to professional name because I read a post and it's uh, why James Chartrand wears women's underpants. That's an awesome post. Yes. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> When I started out, uh, I of course used my own name um, and built my brand around that. Um, mm. But I found there's a lot of bias that goes on. You know, um, I was frequently told by clients, "Well, you can't ask for too much money because you don't know much about the business." Um, you know, we understand that you're a woman with two kids hanging on your legs, so you should be glad to get the money that we're going to get you. Mm. Wasn't a lot people of people actually respect. said that. Yes, I oh, had a wow. client say that. And it was funny because he came back last week asking for a consult. I don't think he knew who I was. And I was like, there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> you mean he knew you when you were under the uh, your... Yeah. I uh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so that lack of disrespect and the fact that my ideas weren't heard. I had some really great ideas for people in business, ways mm -hmm. that it could work better for them or things they yeah. could do. And they would be like, yeah, we'll think about it. And they never did it. Um, at one point when I was building my stable of writers, I needed to hire a whole bunch of people. And I knew the industry, it was, it, there really was predominantly women driven. 
a lot of women writers, and they got catty with each other. I saw it firsthand. I didn't want to get involved in the cattiness, and I wanted to be treated with respect, not with disdain. Mm -hmm. um, so I adopted a male name to hire some writers for me. Yeah. Um, and the difference in the way I was treated was rather incredible. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, what if I just start doing this with clients? I wonder what would happen. Mm -hmm. So I did. I ran my own personal site, and then I started a site with my pen name, which was a male name. The difference in respect was mm -hmm. crazy, and That's the cool. difference in pay rate was crazy as well. It, you you definitely get treated different. Nobody negotiates, you know, your prices are your prices. If you give an idea, that's fantastic. We're going to try it. So, you know, I just ran with it. Yeah. So what do you advise female, do you advise female copywriters to have some kind of persona or what do you tell them? I don't actually. Mm. Having gone through the experience, uh, it's very limiting. It's very limiting. Um, it, it takes a sharp mind to be able to do it very well mm -hmm. and to figure out how to work out certain situations um, such as client calls. Um, it also takes a certain level of confidence in yourself. You have to be able to have enough confidence to uphold a male name. Unfortunately, we have stereotypes. Mm. Men are confident, women are bitches. So you have to, you know, <laughs> you have to be able to uphold a certain mm. level of, it sounds like a man. Yeah. I mean, because they could pick a unisex name. Or something. They could. Uh, my senior copywriter's name is Taylor, and she said it's always served her very well. So mm. when she heard that I had a male name, um, she was like, yeah, of course, why wouldn't you? Because people always assume I'm a man first, just the way things go. Mm -hmm. So how did you come up with that name? Um, I just happened to like the name James, and okay. Chartres is a common French name, so it was kind of a tip of the hat to my roots. Got it. So... Then tell me about when you first started hiring people. What was what was easy? What was what was hard about that? You know, you go from you're working at your kitchen table to now you're hiring all these people. That wasn't hard. The hardest thing was trying not to empathize too much with their situation. Mm -hmm. In business, business is business. You can't get too personal. You can pay what you can pay. But you feel bad. You want to give them more. You want to do right by them. So the hardest thing was trying to balance my needs for my business with my personal values and beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, I was lucky enough that I was able to strike a good middle. And I understood that, you know, I could pay what I could pay. I could treat them the way that I could treat them. They didn't have to stay. I didn't take advantage of them. Uh, I you know, I paid what I thought was reasonable at the time. Now I know much better. I realize there's a lot of hard work that goes into writing, and I definitely offer pay rates that are equivalent to that. But back then, you do the best you can. As yeah. You yeah. So, James, what were the other big milestones you consider in your career? So you hit that top 10 uh, yep. blogs. What was next? Uh, the second, I don't know if this is considered a milestone, but when the story about my name came out, mm. uh, that definitely blew up my world for sure. Yeah. Um, what happened? I had a business partner at the time. We had a little bit of conflict together. She decided that she wasn't going to play fair anymore and started telling people, by the way, James is a woman. And I'm like, no, 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 please don't do that. And she's like, no, 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 James is a woman. Um, so it started to create a lot of questions and uncertainty and you can't have that when you run a business. You yeah. need to be transparent, you need people to trust you. Yeah. So I, I knew Brian Clark well at the time and he said, if you ever want to tell your story, let me know. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, it is time to tell my story. I'm going to grab the biggest microphone that I know of and I will tell it my way right. before anyone else tells it for me. And that's exactly what I did, and that's where that blog post comes from, how uh, James Chartrand wears women's underpants. Right. So it, it just blew up. The media grabbed that. I was like breaking news at the time. I had, uh, I had all kinds of people calling me, wanting interviews. Um, they were back to back to back to back for three solid weeks. Oh. And I basically had to rally my family and friends and say, come help me. I can't take care of my kids. I need to do some crisis management here. Mm. Um, 
And I just put my head down and got through it. And at the same time, I treated my clients as if it's business as usual, let's keep moving on. So I had double obligations going on to right. please the public and to please the full time job with all the interviews. It was crazy. I can certainly see how Hollywood people turn to drugs and alcohol and go nuts for <laughs> really? a while because, oh, yeah, you do. You get so crazy. It's very tiring and you feel very exposed and poked at. And people say terrible things about you. And you're like, my goodness, that's not me, you know? In the comments or during the interview? Um, Oh, mostly in the comments. Mm. I had a lot of comments, uh, a lot of social media talking at the time. I did get a few nasty emails, but you know, what can you do about that? Uh, interviews were very good. People were very respectful. Uh, a couple of newspapers posted some articles that weren't very respectful, mm. but you know, what can you do about that? Uh, I did have one interview with Gloria Felt who I know now is a huge feminist. Uh, I didn't know that at the time. So she asked some very pointed questions um, that made me a little uncomfortable, but really? I think I handled them well. What was she asking? Like, what was um, the point? One question? that I remember was, you know, um, do you feel you're being a good role model for your kids? And and I said, well, absolutely. You know, look look at everything I've done. This is a good. Is way someone going to say no? <laughs> I mean, I guess, yeah, no, I'm I guess maybe. Yeah. And she said, well, what do your kids think of you now? And I said, well, the same thing they thought of me last week and two weeks ago and the year before. Yeah. And she couldn't believe it. And I said, oh, hang on. Do you want to talk to one of my kids? My teenager's right here. I'll let you talk to her. <laughs> and she just backed down. That's actually a good. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, I can't answer for what other people think. So it's it's a silly question to ask of me. So was that a tough post to write or at the time because the person was kind of trying to expose the identity? Was it easier? It's, it's a tough post to write because uh, you want people to understand what you've done. Um, and at the same time, you have to address the fact that some may not. And it may anger some people. Uh, the biggest lashback I had was that a lot of people felt duped, like I'd broken their trust. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure, I'm still not sure today what, what I broke about their trust. I'm still the same person with the same services saying the same things. Um, so the fact that I'm a man or a woman, what does that change? It mm -hmm. was actually more revealing to see the angry comments than it was to get the, the cheers and the well done. Yeah. Yeah. So on the copywriting front, James, yeah. how did you come up with the, the title for the blog post? Because you could have titled this anything, right? Actually, that was Brian Clark. Oh, okay. Yeah, he totally chose that one for me. I like, I'm like that. Here's my piece. He's like, I'm choosing the title. You go for it, man. <laughs> so the um what i know about headlines what is some of your process for coming up with a headline because obviously most of the ones you're coming up with um you know what i i firmly believe you should write a headline first i like mm -hmm. to give titles to whatever i'm working on i consider them a working title they're very flexible i don't rigidly stick to it but it gives me a good guideline mm -hmm. um i write whatever i have to write and then i look back and does the title make sense is it good is it catchy should i change it i kind of tinker with that i don't really have any set processes i'm a little bit of a heathen in that way i don't measure statistics and I don't get all into the right words to say if it feels good it sounds good it reads well that's good enough for me yeah so what's some of the latest blog posts you wrote that uh, just kind of um, rolled off your I had your a guest post recently um, and I titled the post uh, if I remember well it's uh, should you pursue success or popularity hmm. It's just a clear, straight question, and it makes you want to read more because you're like, huh, should I? I don't know. Let's see what this person has to say. So what is your process for that? I know I um, put in the questions, what is some of the final checks that someone makes? And you said you have small checks along the way, small steps. Yeah. So what, tell me about some of those. Yeah, uh, I know a lot of people believe in these big final checklists, but I like to break things down into little steps and make sure I'm doing well along the way. Um, 
So if I'm writing a piece, uh, do I have a good intro? Ah, yes, I do. Moving on. Do I have a good conclusion? I do. Great. Uh, good headline? Yes, absolutely. Um, can I give an example or a personal story? I, I just check myself along the way. I really do write far more intuitively than other people do. Uh, I imagine in my earlier days I was far more careful did I have 30 keywords in my articles. Mm -hmm. um, but now, you know, I just, I just write. Mm -hmm. I just write. Yeah, so what's some of the more success... I mean, when I was looking at some of the copy blogger posts and all these other posts, tons of social media shares and, you know, lots of comments. What, what do you consider some of the most successful blog posts or copywriting projects? One of my favorite blog posts did feature on Copyblogger and it was uh, how to create a rock solid tagline. Mm -hmm. It's a question that I frequently get asked by clients, by people, social media, emails. Oh, we have a new business, we need a great tagline. And I know that people charge through the nose for that, but it really, really is a simple process. And I wrote that post to basically say, here's how you can create your own. And it's as simple as, what is this website about? What can I find here? Why should I keep reading? And that post is one of the ones I refer back to the most today. And I think I wrote it years ago. So, yeah. What about, I want to hear about damn fine words. What do you want to hear? I want to hear, for one, how'd you come up with, why damn fine words? And then I read that also it took you probably over a year to create it in some of what you decide to include or not include. Yeah. Um, then fine words came because uh, a lot of people asked me, how do you do what you do? Where can I learn what you learn? Can you mm. point me to a book? Is there a resource? Is there something? And unfortunately, the answer is no. There is no good resource. There is no good book. I've read them. I've seen them. There isn't anything that, that will teach that to you. And I used to do a lot of uh, helpful advice. I'm really great. I email people free advice all the freaking time. Um, but that gets time consuming. So right. I thought, well, why don't I just build a course and show people and give them an easy system that they can use for themselves. Right. Um, so I began and it did take uh, a full year of solid work. It was a lot of work to put that course together. Um, but I wanted to make sure it was as good as it can be. And then I didn't have a name for it. So when I flew down to uh, Austin for South by Southwest, I was with my team at that time. And we were all sitting around one night uh, having drinks, probably having more than a few. And uh, we started, you know, we got to name this thing. What do we name this thing? And names just started getting tossed out of the hat. And my senior copywriter, Taylor, said, well, you know, them some damn fine words. And we all kind of went, oh. That's it. <laughs> so what did you include in that initial version of the year? What did you remember cutting out that you thought maybe would be very essential, but you know, it just wasn't, wasn't going to work in the course? I didn't cut anything out, but I was very specific about what had to be in it. Yeah. So while I was creating that outline of what lessons there should be, yeah. I really thought what is necessary, what is crucial. Yeah. Um, and it ends up being three chunks. You know, you have your writing mentality and your writing environment. You mm -hmm. have the nitty gritty work and you have the clean and polish phase that lets you move on to publishing. Mm -hmm. These are the three crucial basic stages of writing and yet no one was addressing them. Yeah. So what's something someone should know from, from one or each of those things oh, that would be my important? Goodness. You want me to tell my secrets, I can't <laughs> do that. Um, you know, the biggest thing that people come to me with, or, you know, students in the course mention that they're experiencing a lot, is a lack of confidence. It's, mm. it's huge, it's huge, it's huge, and mm. I think it's only getting worse as the internet grows larger and the competition gets stiffer. Um, so, you know, for me, the most important lesson is relax. It's okay. You, you're going to have your self-doubts. You're going to have your little bits of lacking confidence. It's, it's okay. Trust yourself. Listen to your gut. You're fine. Don't go crazy over this. You know, It's one of the, the things I love to teach the most 
because it really does change people's lives at the end. Yeah, I mean, because if you are starting out, you're going to have lack of confidence. How? What do you? What does someone do? Because it's I'm still, it's still talking, and I still have lack of confidence. Yeah, so it's still go. that voice, that person on their shoulder telling them. Yeah. You know, so what should what should someone do if they're that voice is going on in their head? It's really a matter of training yourself. Voices in your head are often habits that you picked up once upon a time and yeah. just exacerbated them over the years and they just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So you just have to break the habit. You counter the negative talk with the nice little things and you don't believe them at first. Nobody does, of course. But the more you repeat them to yourself, the more you just stick with it and put your blinkers on, you will actually start to counter the negative self-talk. And you'll realize it's not such a big deal. The yeah. world won't end. Believe me, I've been through the end of the world with that media thing. The world doesn't end. Life goes on. Nobody really cares. Only you. Yeah. James, so what was the hardest part about creating the Damn Fine Words course? Sticking a price tag on it. Hmm. <laughs> you, you know, a lot of work goes into these things, a lot of thought. Right. You're like, I'm charging a million dollars. This took me so you know, long. Yeah, like I, I still think I undervalue it. Um, I put a price tag that I feel comfortable with knowing what went into it, what it does for people, uh, and what I do each time I work with students. Yeah. Um, but I've often heard that it should be a lot more expensive than that. And mm. I really struggled with that because I need to sleep well at night. I need to feel like I've done right by people. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm in business. I'm not here yeah. to give things away from, for free. So that was, that was the toughest thing, I think. <laughs> so how did you choose it? Do you choose just, you know, sometimes people say, well, I want them to get 10 times the value, so I choose this, or I just pulled the number out of thin air, or I tested it multiple different price points. What did you do? Um, you know, I picked a number that felt good. Yeah. It's as simple as that. I know it's very common in the industry to say, you know, I'm going to charge based on the value that they will receive, but I'm not one of the people that actually believe that. You have to rein things in because it's very easy um, to charge people exorbitantly and take advantage of them mm -hmm. just by saying, well, the value I bring you is awesome. Well, yes, it is, but at the end of the day, you're no better than someone working in a grocery store or a teacher or, you know, you have to keep things real mm -hmm. in my perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I get hated on a lot for that. So <laughs> You do, really? Yeah, people don't like when I say things like that, but uh, it's, it's part of who I am. I think it's important to not put on airs and really keep things affordable and reasonable and justifiable for the, the clients that we do, sir. Yeah. So James, what was some important feedback you got on the course and how you maybe implemented it? Maybe, I don't know what your process was, if you had some other people look through it beforehand or you just did the first group of students, you had to give feedback. I'm curious of what you... Yeah, I, yeah. I did have and I can't remember their names, but it was only one or two people. I had them actually walk through the course. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, how long does this take you? Is it reasonable? Does it flow well to the next lesson? Does the, that lesson work well with the one that came before? Mm -hmm. And the feedback was I'd pretty much nailed it from the get-go. Really? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It's just preparation, time planning, thinking forward and thinking ahead. So based on, on that little amount of feedback I'd received, I knew it was a good course already. The feedback just kind of gave me that final, yeah, it's good, you're fine, go for it. So I did. And it was a resounding success from day one. And it's just, it's crazy how well it's done. Um, and I really haven't had any negative feedback about it at all except possibly it takes a lot of time. Well, it's work. I'm sorry, this does take, I don't have the magic wand for right. people yet. I'm working on it though. <laughs> that is a tough one. So what do people like most or what do they find most valuable when you talk to them about it? I would say half the people appreciate knowing um, that they're not alone. They didn't realize how many other people had the same issues, feelings, problems, struggles as they did until they get into that group of students. And the interaction they have with each other becomes one of the most valuable parts of the mm. course for them. 
And I, every session I run, they make a little Google Hangout at the end and they, they go and stay in friends for, mm. for years and years. So that's fantastic. Um, the other half of the people are very systematic. They tend not to participate in the group so much, which is unfortunate, but there are people like that. And they appreciate the system. Finally, someone's giving them a do this, do that, do this, do mm -hmm. that, do this, and it works. Mm -hmm. So what's the format for the course? What's the format? Yeah, they I mean, get, is it like there are videos? Um, it's you know, text all the way. Text, okay. Text all the way. It's uh, PDFs, some downloads. The lesson is on the screen. It never made sense to me to offer anything video in a writing course right. because we learn through observation. We learn through reading. So, right. Right. yeah, not for me. I mean, video. a group, but you said there was some group interaction. Is that throughout or just at the end? How does it no, work? No. Throughout, from okay. day one, from the moment they sign up, there's a forum, they hang out, they make friends. I make friends. They're often surprised that I'm as cool a person as I am. So, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so what's been an interesting background? Because I'm sure you get people from all walks of life yeah. in the course. It's amazing. I've had an ambulance driver. I've had several painters. Uh, I had someone who did wrought iron, like fences and stuff like that. Uh, I've had lawyers, I've had teachers, I've had consultants, I've had a clown. It's all industries that you'd never think these people would ever use writing. Yeah. And yet they've always been the people who said, it's crazy how much words are around us and mm -hmm. how much we need to learn these skills. And they take them and transfer them. Uh, I had a speaker who came and said, I don't need to learn writing, but I need to learn how to give a good presentation. Mm -hmm. And it's the same process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, campaigns you thought were going to be highly successful and you thought it was a sure thing that didn't do well. There was one time where you offered a community membership. I did. Yeah, what happened? Well, you know, um, I was seeing all these people at the end of the course, grouping up, making their own hangout, going off. And I'm like, well, why don't I keep that right here? Right. Um, make a big group of alumni that can hang out together. Um, you know, it would have been fun for me. And I would have been able to continue giving them advice because I love doing yeah. that. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, so I asked them flat out, would you love this? And they're all like, yeah, we would love this. And I'm like, great. Put it all together, figured out how it was going to work, sent the email, and I had one sign up. And it was like, hmm. well, what went wrong? Right. Um, and it was just a question. I had forgotten the own ba my own rules. You have to show why something is good for someone. I'd made the assumption that they already knew. Mm, you just put it out there and they'll take it. I just put it out it. there. It's done. Congratulations. Come join me. And they're like, well, why should I? What's in it for me? Mm. Well, you guys told me you wanted this. <laughs> you, you know what's in it for you. I didn't spell it out. Boom. Didn't work. <laughs> so then what did you do? Did you have to create like a whole separate... I just stopped. I'm like, okay, oh. great. I'll look into this, you know, later on. I just spent a lot of work. Didn't work out. Um, I've got other things to do right now. And I still haven't done it yet today. Yeah. <laughs> that it is frustrating because that is a, a good point that you ask what people want and then they, they tell you. They, yeah, then, they don't know what they want. And then you give it to them and they don't want it. Yeah. It reminds me of House. You know how he always said people lie? People lie. They don't mean to. They don't know that they're lying, but they don't actually know what they really want until you put it in front of them and they're like, oh, I thought I wanted blue, but I, I really don't want blue. Not that sort of blue anyways. You know? What yeah, can you well, do? That's, <laughs> you know, that answer troubles me because I'm thinking, well, then how do you avoid that in the future? How do people avoid that? A lot of people do this little testing thing. They do surveys. They launch a small little product, see if it works. If it does, they make bigger ones mm -hmm. that require more of an investment. I'm, yeah, I don't have the time. I don't have the interest to tinker with people that way, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I just tend to watch uh, what people do versus what people say. Yeah. Um, and I try to create things that I see would be of value to them and each time I do now, I make sure I spell it out what's yeah. in it for them. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, James, you have a lot of students. You also have a lot of writers that work for you. What are some of the biggest mistakes you see people making with their copywriting? Oh, my gosh. It, oh, my gosh. 
jargon, jargon. Oh my God. It's still there. It's like industry terms and technical terms and no one understands it. No one understands it. And they're like, yes, but I'm in the metal mining industry. I must use these terms or my peers are going to think I don't know what I'm talking about. But you're not selling to your peers. Your peers don't care. You shouldn't care whether they're judging you. You're trying to sell to this poor little executive who has no idea what you do just mm. use regular language please 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 just use regular language <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's it's hard to convince people of that you know i guess even in my end in the copywriting industry i tend to use some terms sometimes like copywriting and i still get people asking well, what is copywriting you know what is content you think they know right but they don't that's true yeah so what do you use instead of copywriting well, I try to I try to group things together. Content such as articles, autoresponders, emails, sales pages. You know, you, you just give a lot of examples. You try and list examples so that yeah. people can relate to one or the other. Yeah, and one one thing I notice about your posts is you tell stories. I do. So you tell a lot of I stories. I try to. And I know some of this comes naturally. Is there anything you do to spark that creativity or natural storytelling uh, ability? I, I think I tend to do a lot of um, taking what I've seen and observed elsewhere and how does this relate to whatever I'm going to write about. I might be walking down the main street and seeing a sign and realizing, my goodness, if people made more beautiful signs, they would be more successful. I'm going to write a blog post about that. The other day I was walking down the street and I noticed this sign. So it's very easy because I'm drawing on everything yeah. I see around me all the time. Yeah, I mean, if people, your students, maybe not naturally, you know, not natural storytellers, because yeah. even in your posts, like, this is my story, or, you know, you, <laughs> you, that's what you say. What do you tell them to say, no, don't just give these facts. People don't care. They want to hear a story. Is there a way that you get through to them? I don't know, personally, or your writers, or in your course that helps? I think I remind them that you're just having a conversation with one person. Right. Every single piece of writing I write, I'm only writing it for one person out there, the one person it's going to help. So yeah. when you get an image in your mind of who that person is, you mm -hmm. can see them, you can hear their voice, even though they're imaginary, you're having a conversation. And things just suddenly start to flow that much better. The pressure's off. You're not impressing anyone. You're not. People don't speak like that. If I'm talking to you, I'm not going to say, Jeremy. This is my story. One day I was, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't do that. So don't do it in writing. Just have a conversation. Pretend you're sitting around the kitchen table and things just flow out mm -hmm. far more naturally. Yeah. So James, also I want to hear, what are some of the big mistakes that you've learned a lot from in your career? Oh my goodness. I'm sure I've made a lot of mistakes. I've made a recent one, actually, that you might be interested in. Yeah. Um, I had a joint venture um, that didn't go as well as I'd planned. It should have. It was a great product. I believed in it 150%. Um, but the partner that I was putting it together with, he and I were having communication problems. We weren't on the same page. We weren't understanding each other. Um, I was talking feelings. He was talking practical, pragmatic. We just weren't joining up. And the more we were trying to put this project together, the more fighting we were doing between ourselves and getting frustrated and, oh my God, he doesn't understand me and why won't he listen? And he's like, oh my God, she's so crazy. I can't get through to her. It was a lot of communication problems. I should have pushed pause. You know what? It's not working right now. For some reason, we're just not getting it together. Right. Let's put this on hold. We'll come back to it later. I didn't do that. I felt a lot of pressure, which was only me putting pressure on myself yeah. to get this done, to get through it. Yeah. I've committed, therefore I must yeah. follow through. There are times where it's okay not to follow through. You should trust your gut instinct yeah. and just push pause. That's it. That's all. The world won't end. I didn't listen to my own best advice. In other words, yeah. um, 
in the end, it turned out to be okay, okay results, um, lots of resentment. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll get over it. We're big, mature people, and we will have a happy ending, which yeah. is always important. Yeah. Um, but the, the learning experience of that is going to make me think twice down the road. When I communicate with anyone at all, am I on the same page? Am I speaking really well with that person? Yeah, that's probably really common, too. It's incredibly common. It's incredibly common. It's really hard to put yourself in someone else's shoes and try and imagine how we sound like to them mm -hmm. when we think we sound fine to begin with. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult to right. do that, you know? I suppose that's why so many marriages fall apart, eh? <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. And there's another one about working crazy hours. Working, oh my God. Oh my God. What was it like? Yeah. That was, uh, yeah, that was a big one. I, um, I love my job. I love my job. I loved my job back then. I love my job now. Uh, and I used to just feel the need to be there 24-7, catch everything, see what everyone was saying, make sure I was always there for people. This omniscient, omnipresent mm -hmm. presence mm -hmm. on the Internet. Um, so I worked like 16, 18 hour days every single freaking day and mm. you know, I'd forget to eat so I was skinny as a rake and I'm not very big to begin with. Um, I, I, you know, so I stopped to go to the bathroom and that was about it. Um, and it's tiring but I didn't realize it. And one day I actually was typing away and just fell asleep at my desk. <laughs> And I hit my head and cracked my skull. Really? And, oh, oh, God. I had a huge mark. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and it woke me up both literally and figuratively that this is insane. You just can't sustain yourself like this. Yeah. Your body's going to shut you down. And I went through a period where I just let my body do its own thing. If yeah. I was tired, I went to bed. If I was awake, I, I was awake. No more alarm clocks, no more yeah. checking my watch. I took them all out of the house and just lived like ancient people did back before time existed. Um, and it really changed my life. It really, really did. I, I'm far sharper now than I was back then. Back then I was running on adrenaline and, a, you yeah. know, the last gasoline fumes. Now I'm running on creativity and productivity. Yeah. Um, I'm a lot healthier. Um, I still don't really work by the clock. You know, I rarely know what time it is. I wake up at four in the morning because I feel like it. I'm in bed at eight o'clock at night. So all my friends think I'm boring because I don't go out and party. But what can you do, right? <laughs> I guess if you go to bed at eight, you wake up at four, that's eight hours of sleep. So that's eight hours of sleep. How do you change that though? Because you know, you're, you were so used to working 16 to 18 hour days and yeah. then you go to just doing whatever, you know, that that's gotta be tough too. It was a very conscious decision. It was a very, I must do this for myself. Mm -hmm. I must do this for my kids. I remember the first two weeks, um, Making the decision was hard and sticking with it was also hard. However, the minute I gave myself permission to sleep when I wanted to, yeah. I was exhausted. I was exhausted all the time. I was napping all over the place. And I actually <laughs> caught yeah. up on a lot of the sleep I'd missed. Wow. So it wasn't that hard to make the transition yeah. to a normal lifestyle. Yeah. I ask for a selfish reason because I find myself trying to do that. Oh, you know, I need to set, I need to go to bed by midnight. I'm staying up way too late or whatever. And that, and then it lasts for a day. And then two days later, I'm like, oh, I really have to get this done. And I'm up till two or three in the morning. Yeah. So yeah. it's funny because in, in my damn fine words, writer's course, um, a lot of the students actually stay up till 12 to three in the morning. And this is normal for them. And they'll yeah. say, Oh, I'm not a morning person. Well, I wouldn't be either if I went to bed at two in the morning, right. you know, <laughs> Um, yes. And I, I try to get through to them that your most creative hours biologically, physiologically yeah. are in the early morning. Yeah. And those who make the effort to turn themselves around and, you know, forcibly go to bed, um, they actually see a really big difference and become converts. They, they go from night owls to early birds mm -hmm. like you wouldn't believe. And the, they're, they all swear they'll never go back. One of my biggest things was I'd read in bed with my child 
So I'd be like, okay, it's nine o'clock, must go read in bed with my child. I'd be out like a light in 10 seconds. <laughs> and I'd just stay there. I wouldn't even bother to move myself. You know, I'm sleeping. Let's sleep. Yeah, don't move me. <laughs> so your most creative time and most creative time in the yep. morning. So what you do betcha. you do when you hit your most creative time? What's your, what's your routine look like? I have a very specific routine um, because Robert Cialdini says we must train our brain to write on demand. So I built in a routine that never fails. I'm always doing this same routine. Mm -hmm. uh, wake up, grab a cup of coffee, feed the cats, sit down at the computer, read my email. Do not answer anyone. Nobody can make a coherent sentence in the first 15 minutes of life. Um, so I make sure that I don't I can read, I can skim, I can browse, but I don't actually write anything um, until much later. Um, eight o'clock in the morning, I have a kid that needs to get on the school bus. I make a point of walking outside with her and I wait with her at the bus stop um, just to get out, mm -hmm. breathing air, seeing the world yeah. because it's very easy to stay cloistered in your office mm -hmm. when you're a writer. Um, come back in, have some breakfast, watch some cash cab. It's my little What's morning thing. Cash cab? Yeah, I don't know That's, what that is. It's a taxi cab, um, and he picks up people, and it's a game show that happens oh, in cab. Someone has mentioned I've never they seen it. They have to answer trivia questions, and if they get them right, they win money. If they get them wrong, he throws them out of the cash cab. Okay. <laughs> it's awesome. I love trivia, so I'm sitting there yelling answers at the TV every morning. Cash cab's over, hit the decks. I know exactly what I'm supposed to work on every day. So I sit down and just begin working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that cold Canadian air probably wakes you up in the morning when you go outside. You, I'm you sure. have no idea. We had some minus 35 Celsius, oh. which is, I think, close to minus 40 Fahrenheit. I had like two months of that. It's it was worst nightmare. brutal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. I love winter. <laughs> James, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask about your lowest moment? I have to say that I don't, I have a couple of low moments in business. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have to be business. Yeah, my personal lowest moment, um, my dad passed away when I was 17. Mm. He had Alzheimer's disease. Well, uh, sorry. And no, yeah. that's okay. Not your fault. Yeah. And uh, we learned, I was about 13 when we learned that. So he lived longer than expected with the disease. And we kept him as home at home as long as we could. Um, it was a really difficult period uh, of my life, made double because I was in that teenager phase when you're just trying to figure out who you are. So it was a very low point and losing your dad is a low point if, worse, you, yeah. you know if you care about them i know some dads aren't the best yeah. so what can you do but i love my dad a lot and i still miss him today it's been a 25 year anniversary uh, oh wow this december so you you never really forget the yeah, people that you love you know it can be i mean obviously it's always tough but something like that where yeah. someone kind of deteriorates is also it's, it's brutal because you don't get a chance to say the things that you need to say. You don't get a chance to do the things that you need to do. You don't get a chance to connect and say goodbye. You get forgotten because yeah. they don't remember you. Yeah, yeah. And it's very painful. And it's, it's, you know, I reacted in all kinds of teenager ways far more than I should have. And for a while, um, I wasn't quite sure myself if I'd end up being that bad kid on the streets um, or if I was going to turn out to be okay. But I did turn out to be okay because, you know, you get through it. You just get through these things. So everything mm. that came along afterwards in business and in life, mm. it just pales in comparison to yeah. me. Like there's really no low point. It's just, well, here's a challenge. Yeah. Here's something I have to go through. I've been through the worst I can be through. Yeah. You know? Yeah. When you compare yeah. it to that, then yeah. everything, yeah. it's just a perspective. Nothing yeah. really seems that significant. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Eh? Yeah. yeah. So on the other side of things, what's been one of the proudest accomplishments or proudest moments? Building damn fine words. I'm so proud of that course. I'm so proud of that course, especially with all the courses that are being created out there today, it's a really nice way to make money on the internet. It's very easy to do with all the tools and resources we have. 
Um, but I'm super proud because I put a lot of thought and effort into it. I really poured my heart into it and asked myself, what would I have wanted to learn? Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't just create it for other people to help them. I created it for my previous self when I was starting out. And, and I'm really pleased with how it's come together. And I always promised it will change people's lives. And what's most fulfilling to me is that it has. It has. I have. I have seen people's lives change, like almost all of them. Um, and that's a big promise to be able to live up to. Yeah. I'm really proud of that. Really. So, proud. what's one of those stories that you think of that someone's told you that's changed their life? Um, there is a guy named Jesse, Jesse Lonclo, uh, who came to the course, didn't know him, little hotshot, thought he was good at everything, was going to race through the course and, and do it all. He was going to be a copywriter and that's all fine and well, but the course slowed him down, made him think, and he worked really hard at it. He gave it 110% and did everything he was supposed to do. He mm -hmm. figured if I'm going to pay someone 1600 bucks for a course, I'm going to squeeze everything I can out of it and he did um, and four years later he now works for me and he's one of my best assets he's a great guy um, and he has truly built the life that he wanted and I think that course um, was the, the you know the tipping point for him yeah I mean something like that again you spend so much time energy and effort then on top of that you have to get students yeah. How, how did you find, what was successful for you to actually get students to get the I course? Was, yeah, I was super lucky because I was such a big deal at Men With Pens that I already had my fans and followers. Hmm. So the, launching wow. the course, the I first don't like the word lucky because you created, <laughs> you create you know, create Men With life. Pens. Agreed. So, but yeah, go on. I was fortunate enough. Um, well, you put the hard work into creating it, you I know? Did. I did. I did. Um, I rode my own coattails, and that's pretty cool. Um, so at that yeah. point, you had built up an audience with men. Are you making pens. me think? You know, I'm yeah. sitting here like philosophizing yeah. on life here. Yeah. <laughs> that's what. That's good. <laughs> this, yeah. I mean, you've already been up for, you know, a long time, so it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose, eh? <laughs> yeah, so what did you do to build? I mean, obviously you put a lot of time and energy. You did t I mean, 10 pages of posts from Copy yeah. Blogger. Yeah. I showed up. I showed up. I showed up. I did the work. I didn't complain. What did you do when you launched it? Did you just send it to your list? What did you, yeah. you know? I just sent it to my list. It's here. The thing you've been waiting for. Yeah. I built, built up a lot of anticipation over the year, working hard on my course. I'm doing mm -hmm. this on my course today. Can't wait until it's launched. You, of course, talk about what you're yeah. excited about. Yeah. Uh, for me, it was natural. It wasn't a ploy. Um, and it actually paid off really well because it built natural anticipation for people. So when I opened doors, shloom, they came in mm -hmm. of course as you know when your followers jump in well now they've done it so you have to get other people who may not be your followers so in that sense I you know I still guest post I still hang out on social media I use a little bit of AdWords now and then I'm exploring with different ways of getting people into the course mm -hmm. um, yeah marketing you know everyone has to do it what was uh, successful about again it goes back to building up men with pens yeah what was successful or what worked well with with building that up you know i'm a very different person today than i was when i first started men with pens mm -hmm. i if you read some earlier posts they're full of arrogance there there's a lot of swagger going on i thought i was hot shit and i walked the talk you know um and it drew people Probably just that confidence. She's confident, or at the time he's confident. Cool person. I should hang around with that person. Um, I'm a little more quiet these days. I've gotten over myself. You know, everyone has to. <laughs> but there's a genuine flavor and a genuine caring that's always been there. I've never been shy about helping people. So if mm -hmm. people left me a comment, I would answer personally every single one. If mm -hmm. people asked a question, I would answer it personally every single one. And I'd do what I could to help make their day better. And mm -hmm. I've always done that and I still do that today. So I think that has 
um, probably more impact than the swagger and the cockiness. Mm -hmm. So that was fun too. Yeah. So who are some of your most influential mentors and some of the advice they've given you? I really, I really don't ha. Huh, I really don't have any people that I look up to because I realize that we're all ordinary in our own mm -hmm. ways. You know, nobody's any more special than anybody else. Mm -hmm. I really admire Brian Clark uh, of Copy Blogger. He was one of the first who got into this whole blogging thing, and he basically paved the way for everyone else that came after, at least in my industry and in my niche of online marketing. Right. Um, and he was, he's very smart, he's very sharp, and he can see things ahead, and he's not afraid to try and experiment and say, well, that doesn't work, we're not doing that anymore. He, he's not afraid of that at all. And he's got a lot of confidence and a lot of just something that I wish I had, that leadership feeling. I probably have it and don't realize it, who knows. Um, but yet at the same time, he's very human, he's very gentle, he's very shy. I've met him in person, he's incredibly shy. Just, you know, the, almost the complete opposite of how he portrays himself online. But if you blend it all together, yeah, he's a real person. And one thing that he really did that changed my life, he was having some kind of course or membership forum or something that, you know, oh, maybe that's the one thing I'm missing. If I just get into this, I can actually get that little that thing that's going to make me even more right. successful. Yeah. And I emailed him and I said, you know, is this the right, should I be taking, Brian, what do you think? Should I get in on this? And he just answered me back with a single sentence, just a single sentence. What do you think you're going to learn that you don't already know? And I just sat there and yeah. Dude, you just lost yourself a customer. <laughs> <laughs> it, but I could have taken that either way. I could, have, I could have given him a list of all the things I thought I didn't know. But the truth is, I know this all. And whatever I don't know, I don't need that to figure it out, you know? Mm -hmm. you got to rely on your own smarts sometimes and quit chasing that one thing that we all know is out there, that magic wand, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, James, that's true. Thanks for sharing that. The, you know, I've I have two more questions, and I usually say one more question, but I well, you're and you'll, them you'll in. see why. <laughs> but but uh, before I ask, where what are you working on now? Where should people check you out? Um, actually, I'm going to start a little self challenge thing. I used to be very very heavy into social media, and I was like the Twitter king or the Twitter queen at the time. It's always there, and I dropped out of it because it got really commercialized, and everyone's promoting everyone. There's lots of links. Mm -hmm. I want some of that human interaction back. Mm -hmm. I'm going to challenge myself to show up 30 minutes a day every day on Twitter and just be human. No promotion. No no links. Just talking with people and I'm curious to see where it'll go after 30 days well I've wasted my time am I a dinosaur is it going to restart something you know I hope that people join in and challenge themselves to just be real people chatting with real people um, the other thing I am working on I do have an ebook writing course it's like damn fine words for ebooks mm -hmm. um, I've run it once in the past and uh, I put it on the shelf for a little bit it's an intensive course I've taken it back off the shelf and I've been working on the 2.0 version, you know, streamlining things, getting some cool handouts going. I'm working on that and I'm really excited to be able to bring that back out to people because uh, I, I think people really like it. Yeah. So where should they check you out online? What, uh, what sites or? www.damnfinewords.com. You can always find me there. Uh, if you want to see me on Twitter, it's uh, Men With Pens. Simple, sweet. You can also check me out at menwithpens.ca for Canada. Um, right. So those are the three places. But uh, most often, damnfinewords.com, that's where people will really reach me. And, you know, anyone's free to email me anytime. There's contact forms all over the place. It's really mm. easy to get in touch with me. Yeah. So two questions. One. Besides personal family and friends, have you told anyone your real name in the professional world? There are a handful of people who know my real name. And I mean handful. I think I can count on, on my fingers, you know, right. one hand, not two. Uh, the people who know my real name. Um, 
it's one of those things that when you start using a persona name, hearing your real name in a business context is like, that doesn't fit. That's like nails on a chalkboard. Please don't call me that because I'm not that person at that time. It doesn't mean I'm acting. I'm just, you know, like some days you're mom, some days you're the professional, some days mm-hmm. you're the girlfriend, right. some days I'm James, some days I'm not. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, it's a curiosity factor for people. And I know that you're not going to tell me if I ask what your, what your <laughs> name is. Well, I figure, you but, know, there are some enterprising people out there that if they want to know my name, yeah. it is out there, yeah. it, is, uh, it is able to be found. The problem uh, with saying it isn't yeah. so much that it's nails on a chalk. I don't even want you to say it. I mean, it's like one of those things that, Ooh, like, a like a magician, like a magician, you know, you want to know the trick, but you don't because it... Yeah. It creates some kind of yeah. curiosity there. You it, know what I mean? It would change things for me too yeah. to suddenly say, "Well, here's who I am." It would mm. change. It would feel different. I don't. I don't know if I want to go there yet. Um, mm. And you know, the sad fact is, everything's been published under James Chartrand. Right. So if I use my real name and say I wrote that, they're going to say, "Well, no, James did." Yeah, yeah, I'm James. So you have to re-explain the whole story a million times over and I just don't have time for that. I'm old, you know? <laughs> Not yet. So my last question, James, is... Um, I must you know, move around a lot. I'm, I'm noticing on the screen really? I use my hands and I move. That's good. I'm like you're, Gordon Ramsay. You're animated. <laughs> um, you know, that the reporter who asked about your daughters. Yes. I'm curious. So they see you as a successful entrepreneur, writer... What kind of stuff, how does that influence them? What do they want to get into? Like, what, what do you see there when you talk to my them daughters. about? My daughters. Yeah, your daughters, yeah. My daughter, they want nothing to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> how old are they? Uh, I have one who's 10, uh, going on 35, and yeah. uh, the other one is 22, going on okay. 47. Yeah. Um, so there's a good variance between them, 10 years between them. Yeah, um, there's a balance there, you know, and I think it's an important thing to, to mention. Like, throughout this, you're, you're raising a family. It's not yeah. just your business, and yeah. I'm wondering, you know, what's your 22 year old want to do, and how do you create that that balance? Because obviously, you've been a mom this whole time, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting because it's very important to me to keep my private life private. Mm. I don't want to walk down the street and have people point at me. I don't want my kids to go to school and get have them be teased because their mom is so and so. They're entitled to have their life their way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just keep everything separate. Of course they know who I am. Of course yeah. they know what I do. We talk about it all the time. Right. Um, and I think they have a good sense of business because just the way I behave in For general. For sure. I mean, it comes yeah. up at the dinner table. It's, it's yeah, everywhere. Sure. So my daughter, the, the, 22- I have two daughters as well. So I'm asking from selfish yeah. reasons. Yeah. 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 They, they pick up more than we think. Um, my 22-year-old is actually manager at, at a David's Tea store. She has a staff of 30. Mm. Yeah, and it's not something that we foresaw for her, but we realized that she was choosing jobs that were always in managerial positions, mm-hmm. that were always helping other people have a better business. It's kind of like a mirror effect. She doesn't feel that way. She's making her own life, right. but... She from saw what from I you. see, she's picked up stuff from me and yeah. is more successful because of what she sees me do or right. what we've discussed. Um, the littlest one is super interested in marketing. You know, mm. we make fun of television commercials all the time. Yeah. And I've, y- you educate through that. Oh, right. see how that bank commercial is making you feel guilty? Well, this is what they're trying to get you to do. So she's very wise to the ways of the world already which mm-hmm. means she's probably going to have less chance of being duped later on in life out of sheer naivety so mm-hmm. that's cool um but neither of them care really they think that james is a joke we joke about it all the time uh i've actually i had to write my last will and testament you know now that i'm a mature adult and who would i leave my business to was anyone interested and they're all like we don't want your business that's retarded so <laughs> okay well somebody's going to inherit it good luck with it <laughs> you know yeah. they they really are making their own life but they yeah. you know i i guess i hope that I influence them in some positive ways for sure. There's some osmosis with yeah. the marketing. But they don't, they don't take me seriously at all. Yeah. Which I'm is sure, 
you know, underneath, you know, that come they'll come back, right? So yeah. <laughs> when they get when they get older. Yeah. Yeah. But James, I appreciate it. This has been fantastic. And you thank know, you. thank you so much for sharing your your tips and knowledge with us. I, I it's my pleasure. You know, I hope that people who are listening get something out of this too. I don't want to waste anyone's time. Um, but I do enjoy chatting and sharing my stories and I hope yeah. that someone else enjoys them as well. And it's been great to talk to you. Yeah, like and uh, you know, say hi to Michelle Forte for I me. I will do that. <laughs> thank you so much, James. All right, I appreciate thanks, it. Jerry.